So text analysis is one of the most widely used techniques in digital humanities, but there can be a lot of confusion about what it is and what technologies we're talking about because the field is pretty vast and because some of the technologies are a little bit hard to track. So in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about those technologies that are in active use right now within digital humanities, uh, some of their pluses and minuses, and then I'll walk you through a very recent piece of text analysis scholarship and we'll talk about some of the ways that various text analysis technologies are layered on top of each other to produce some meaning that has salience for a field within the humanities. The first thing I wanted to say is that uh, text analysis, as you may have gathered, is not one tool. The term text analysis refers to a whole bunch of different tools and techniques that are all designed to locate meaning in a text computationally. And so what's interesting about text analysis, particularly for a humanist, is that each tool or technique has, I think, implicitly an argument about where meaning lives in a text. Is meaning to do with individual words? Is it to do with words and context? Is it to do with the structure of a document? So we'll see how some of the different technologies deal with this huge question of how texts create meaning. So we'll start with the TEI, or the Text Encoding Initiative, which you may have heard about because it's one of the older uh, text analysis methods active within digital humanities. So this field is as old as DH itself. And the way it works is that TEI encoders, so these are actual people, learn to mark up documents using a language called TEI. So with specifications about how you mark up different kinds of documents. So if you look at the document in this slide here, you'll see that there are opening and closing brackets. And these tags are used to describe the content they contain. TEI documents are rendered in a version of XML, an extensible markup language, and all of the elements can nest inside each other. So here we have a chapter, then we have a verse, and you could also have sub units within the verse. So the benefits of TEI are manyfold. They, TEI means that a human has sat with the text and made actual decisions about how to mark it up. And once those decisions have been made explicit, y you can rely on those tags to be consistent. And let's see how this um, plays out in a venerable TEI project called Women Writers Online. So in Women Writers Online, a, a large corpus of texts by women writers have been marked up in TEI and then made available, presented to readers in lots of different ways. And because TEI allows you to do things like mark characters' gender, you can create interesting visualizations such as this one, which shows the proportion of female to male characters in the Convent of Pleasure and the Amorous Prince and begin to give some thought to you how that affects your interpretation of each of these works. That's a basic use of TEI, but again, because a human being has sat with the text and made some decisions, you can rely on the data to be relatively sound. You can also do more complex kinds of analysis. For example, this is a more recent visualization created by the Women Writers Online project that will tell you the top person, organization, or place names in each text collection by publication year. And you can see that you're able to explore these elements in lots of different ways because of the strength of the visualization and because of the granularity and the specificity of the text markup. 
in TEI. So lots of benefits to marking up a text in TEI. You have lots of reliable data, as granular as you like, as specific as you like, and focusing on any area of the text that you specify. But there are some drawbacks to TEI as well. I think chiefly it requires a lot of labor, like you actually have to have a human being sitting and marking up the text. And so in the last few decades, some methods of text analysis have grown in popularity in part because they rely on computers to do some of that decision making that in TEI comes down to a human being. So we can talk, for example, about named entity recognition, which is a branch of natural language processing. And named entity recognition is to some extent what it sounds like. It allows you to put a text into a recognition tool and the text can then find what we might call proper nouns. So people, places, things, organizations. So let's try that with the first couple of um, paragraphs from the New York Times. So not bad. You can see that it's identified organizations, dates, people. Now you're not getting the subtlety that you might get with the TEI, but it's a heck of a lot faster. And if, if you decide to use named entity recognition, you can export the data in mass so that you can work with a lot of data very quickly. So I would say the first level of complexity within text analysis and digital humanities is what we might call word frequency analysis, which tracks the, well, as it says, the frequency of individual words throughout a text. And you may have played with something like this if you've ever worked with Google Ngrams, which allow you to do things like trace the relative frequency of terms like Einstein, Sherlock Holmes, and Frankenstein over two centuries. So you can see that Frankenstein has really overtaken his rivals by 2000. Now, what that means is a little fuzzy. I don't know exactly what that means, but, but should you have a hypothesis, you could perhaps test it with n-grams. I was curious about the word COVID. And yeah, this is interesting because it seems to me that perhaps COVID used to mean something else, perhaps a unit of measure of some kind. So I will leave that to you to investigate. I'd be very interested in knowing. Word frequency analysis can be really interesting. You also see it in things like word clouds, which are rough measures of um, the frequency of different words within a piece of text. In this case, we're looking at the, a word cloud of Joe Biden's inaugural speech. And word clouds, text analysis pros love to hate on word, word clouds because yeah, they are crude and they size things perhaps in a confusing way and don't tell you much beyond the frequency of different words. They don't do a lot to distinguish between similar words. So lots of limitations with word clouds. I always rooting for the underdog, so I kind of like word clouds. I find that students um, especially find word clouds helpful in getting a first overview of a text, and then they go on to parse meaning a little bit more finely. But you could do something like compare the word cloud for Biden, for Biden's inaugural speech with that of Trump, and see if you can make any interesting observations there. Seems like democracy is like the main defining difference between the two speeches. But there are some limitations with these kinds of analysis that require that rely on word frequency. And this illustration helps us understand why that might be. So here I've loaded up an n-gram for lead and titanium, and we can see that titanium here is much less frequently used than lead. So that might incline you to say something like, okay, I guess lead was much more popularly used than titanium. But then 
you might pause and remember that lead could also mean lead. So a, a word frequency analysis isn't going to be smart enough to disaggregate different meanings of a word that is visually similar. It's not going to tell you what topic it represents. And perhaps if the, the name of, a, of something has changed over time, the names of races, for example, it's not going to be able to follow those changes as they evolve over time. It's just a crude measure of individual words. And so in response, we've begun to see some, some other methods for, for finding meaning in texts in, in a way that accounts not only for individual words, but for the context in which they're used. And so we'll get to those in just a sec. I just wanted to mention a couple other popular kinds of analysis that you might encounter. Concordances are an ancient method of tracing words in texts. Uh, you might have seen a biblical concordance, and with one of these you can see where a word is used in the Bible and also a little bit about its context. So another way of like tracking meaning as it is used throughout a text. Topic modeling is in a way a response to that lead problem. So it's an effort to find not only individual words, but the general topics that they represent within a text or a large body of text. Now what topic modeling calls a topic is really a cluster of words that tend to co-occur in the same document. And to illustrate this, we can take a look at a project called Signs at 40 which looks at 40 years of the feminist journal Signs, and the topic analysis has identified these clusters of words that appear within Signs. And you can see that they're just clusters of words. A human being has to decide what the name of the topic is. So that's an interesting area of, of analysis, actually, is naming these topics. And we can dive in a little deeper and figure out like where these topics appear in articles, in signs. We can also look at how topics have changed over time, which is quite interesting. So we can see that the topic of the social has consistently been of interest to signs, while other areas like historical terms have seemed to rise and fall in interest. And others, globalization, for example, were almost non-existent at the beginning, but have become more popular over time. And that's what topic modeling allows you to do, to find clusters of words to which a human being then assigns name, and to trace those clusters, those clusters of words as they appear in a text or in many texts. So it's great for comparing lots of different texts with each other. And it is a kind of machine learning. Those of you in my DH201 class will talk a lot more about how topic modeling works in class. But with topic modeling, we're getting from straight counts of words to kinds of machine learning, of which topic modeling is one. Sentiment analysis also uses machine learning, in this case, to classify texts by moods. Now, uh, most crudely, sentiment analysis looks at like positive and negative sentiments within a text, although there are ways to use it to look at s more subtle differences like anger or happiness. But still, these divisions of sentiment are fairly crude. This is a sentiment analysis expert would be the first to volunteer that this is not an incredibly um, subtle or finely detailed method of analyzing sentiment, but it can be applied to a large body of texts. In this case, the scholar Matt Jockers at the University of Nebraska has created a sentiment analysis package and applied it to a set of novels and argued that you can use this, this graphic form, this plot trajectory of sentiment to show a characteristic pattern of sentiment that characterizes an identifiable set of books within a corpus. So that's a way in which sentiment analysis might be used.
Network analysis, which we'll talk about in more detail in a subsequent class, looks at who interacted with whom, or it could even be like ideas that interact with each other or elements of a novel or another kind of document that interact with each other. So you can see here that the network depicts the characters in Hamlet as one might expect, is a central character, as are Claudius and Horatio, because they tend to interact with the most characters. And because network analysis is a field in itself, which has its own methods of divining meaning from the way that elements interact, you can use network analysis to draw out implications of meaning from a text. It can be a little hard, I think, in a first encounter with a network analysis of a text to see anything particularly interesting. Like here, it's clear that Horatio, Hamlet, and Claudius are main characters, but like we knew that's not, that's not new news for us. But other scholars have used network analysis in more interesting and subtle ways. For example, the the scholar James Lee has used it to show how space and social disorder can be visualized using network analyses and traced through Shakespeare's works in interesting and provocative ways. So James Lee's work is always, I think, really interesting to look at because he uses text analysis in, to me, really unexpected ways. Word embeddings are also called vector analysis, uh, a method of text analysis that has risen quite a bit in popularity over the last five or ten years. And word embeddings aim to show the context of words by assigning to them a vector, an actual series of digits that can then be plotted in space. So that's why they're called word vectors, because they can actually be plotted on a chart. And because there are numerical representations for these numbers, you can do things like, you can almost do math with words. So for example, you can say with word embeddings that king is to queen as man is to woman. So they're quite interesting for people who are interested in similes and analogies. So you can also say something like king minus man equals queen. So you're doing arithmetic with, with individual words because you have assigned numerical values to them and placed them in a kind of space which depicts the clusters of context within a document or set of documents. It's hard to get your head around, but we can start to see an, an example of this by looking at really a demo project created by Lynn Cherney, which uses a word embedding tool called word to vec and applies it to the, the work of Jane Austen's books. And as she explains, she's replaced the nouns in Pride and Prejudice with the nearest words in that model. So the words nearest to the word should be those that are closest in meaning. So I think we know the famous first line of Pride and Prejudice. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in search of, oh, what is it? A fortune must be in need of a wife. Here, Word to Vec has <clears throat> substituted those words which it believes to be most similar, because as you can see, they appear close together in vector space. And yeah, it's interesting. I, it's because there are some cases where it's clearly that doesn't make that makes like opposite sense, but it really is more of a demo of what word embeddings are than it is an argument about anything in particular. Definitely worth playing with, very interesting. So worth looking at word embeddings and word to vec in particular, if you're interested in tracing analogies in text and looking at how words appear in context. So it's a slightly different understanding of where meaning lies than something like topic modeling and certainly uh, word frequency analysis. And I think in order to decide which method 
make sense for your work, you really have to spend some time with some big ontological questions about what is meaning in a text. Where can it be found? Is it somewhere in between words? Can it be translated into data at all? And that's one of the reasons I find text analysis interesting is because it does raise some really provocative questions about like, where is meaning? <laughs> what is meaning? What is a text? And so where do you find these kind of leading edge works of text analysis? As you might have surmised, some of the most computationally sophisticated text analysis work in digital humanities is in some ways at least intelligible, if not somewhat overlapping with a field like natural language processing, which is more affiliated with computer studies than with the humanities. And so we're starting to see a great deal of overlap between the two fields. Nevertheless, I think text analysis analysis experts who associate themselves with digital humanities would distinguish themselves from someone in something like NLP because of the nature of the questions that they ask, which are humanities questions. And in the last five to 10 years, we've seen a little bit of a peeling off of some of the most computationally sophisticated work in text analysis into a field that is coming to be called either cultural analytics or computational humanities, depending on who you ask, because some of this computationally sophisticated work is difficult for a newcomer to grasp and the practitioners were getting tired of explaining the basics to people who weren't familiar with some of the fundamental assumptions of computational text analysis. All kinds of interesting implications of that move, but for now I'll just say that it does exist. It's interesting to watch. And you'll see it played out in a journal like the Journal of Cultural Analytics, a relatively new journal where you'll find very computationally intensive work that experiments a great deal with different models. And in a new organization called Computational Hist Hist Humanities Research, which just started holding a conference, I thought it would be interesting to take their accepted papers and throw them into a word cloud just out of, I don't know, spite. <laughs> no, just because it's interesting. The most denigrated form of text analysis, but they can't stop me. I can still do a word cloud of it. And here you'll see, hmm, interesting. I'm not actually sure what, what picture as PDF is, but it looks like I better learn because it's quite prominent within this field. OCR means optical character recognition. Interesting. We could do a t like, a, like a topic model or a vector space analysis of these paper abstracts as well and see what we learn, or we could just read them. How does this all come together? Like, how do you use these methods to actually discern meaning in historical or humanistic documents? I wanted to close with an example of how text analysis experts might layer tools on top of each other in order to create chains of meaning that actually have some salience and substance for experts in the humanities, the historical fields, and, and literature fields. And so we'll look at a new piece in the Journal of Cultural Analytics from Sandeep Soni, Lauren Klein, and Jacob Eisenstein that was just published on January 18th, looking at abolitionist networks modeling language chains, change in 19th century activist newspapers. So these scholars take as their sources, their, their corpus, abolitionist newspapers, which, of course, there were many, of which there were many in the 19th century. And the question that they open with is, because of the nature of the archive and because of systemic racism and heteropatriarchy, those um, artifacts that survive tend to tell us most about what white male abolitionists were doing. And yet, historians have increasingly found that black people and black women in particular 
were very active in the abolitionist movement, including in the abolitionist press. And so given that there is a paucity of documents that reflect their activity, is there a way to read between the lines to discern the influence of some of these more seldom recognized actors in history? And can we use sophisticated modes of text analysis to draw out more about their influence? And of course, the proposition is that yes, we can. And they use an interesting set of techniques in order to argue for the influence of two newspapers in particular, one helmed by a black woman and one by a white woman and including a, a multiracial editorial board. So let's look at how they make that argument. So they first perform a vector space analysis and their interest here is to watch how the meaning of words have changed over time, as well as the introduction of new words in particular. And the proposition that they make is that these evolutions of words meaning, as well as the introduction of new words, can be allied or considered coincident with new ideas and new concepts. So as the words change, the concepts are evolving, and we can trace evolving concepts by tracing evolving words. Now, they don't just say that, they support that with lots of substantive, substantive research, which I'm not going to recite for you. You should go back to the article and read it, but, the, but this is the proposition, that we can see words changing over time, and as those words change, we can match that up with changing concepts and ideas. And there were a lot of words identified that did, in fact, change over time. And they used, again, as I said, vector space analysis to make this observation. And then they looked at the newspapers which tended to lead in the changing use of words or the introduction of new words. And they were able to characterize a set of newspapers as tending to lead in the evolution of language and some as tending to follow. And again, this is a carefully constructed argument with lots of data to support it. Here I'm caricaturing it. But the graph gives you an interesting look into what they what they have surmised about these newspapers. Each abbreviation here is the name of a leader newspaper, one that tended to evolve language. And <clears throat> each newspaper here is a follower. So one that kind of followed in the footsteps of a leader and used their mode of speaking and writing. And you'll see that actually they are one in the same in a lot of cases. But nevertheless, there were cases of leadership and cases of followership that we can identify. And this is called a Sankey diagram, or some kind, sometimes it's called an alluvial diagram, which I, th I think sounds prettier. And so you can see that this newspaper, The Liberator, tended to lead in word usage, and the followers were NAS, which is an abbreviation that I unfortunately can't remember, I apologize, and GLB. So you trace those colors back to see who is following in their footsteps. And then you can do things like break out the newspapers into which ones had black editors as leaders, which ones had women editors as leaders, which ones had black editors that tended to follow, which tended to lead. So you can, you can divide it in this way in order to get a better picture of what actors of different social classifications might have been doing during this period. Given that the archive is relatively uh, sparse for other kinds of activity that these people might have been engaged in, can we discern from the existing archive that they were in fact leaders in thought and concepts? And in, in a lot of cases, the authors find they, they can be said to be leaders in this, in this particular way that's reflected in language change.
And here you can see they've also used network analysis to try to make this argument. This is not a network, it's the sum of all of the network statistics that they did. And they've used network analysis to discern how often, how important the newspapers were in, in their leadership role. So they used a set of principles derived from network analysis to make arguments about which newspapers were most important in leading change. And they've identified two newspapers in particular which led many changes and followed the fewest changes. So they tended to be leaders, but not followers. And so that's how we get to their conclusion, which is that we should be looking at these two newspapers, both led by women, one by a black woman and one by uh, a multiracial coalition. We should reconsider our understanding of these two newspapers and attribute to them a leadership role that we may not have recognized without this kind of text analysis. So as you can see, this goes way beyond like n-grams or word clouds. This is layering different kinds of text analysis on top of each other and creating a kind of chain of arguments that result in a conclusion that does have clear salience for people in the field of abolitionist studies or 19th century history or African-American history or history of the press. It just took uh, a lot of operations in order to get there. So that's where I'm going to end for the purposes of this lecture in class. We're going to actually do some text analysis ourselves. We'll talk a lot more about topic modeling and you'll get to tell me where you think meaning can be found.